I'm Jace Lacob, and you're listening to Masterpiece Studio. For nearly two decades, Noel Gordon had been playing fan favorite Meg Mortimer in the ATV soap opera drama Crossroads. Gordon's Meg ran the fictitious Crossroads Motel, a Midlands pit stop which she had converted from her Georgian estate and now boasted 16 chalets. It was a role that brought Gordon countless awards and endless adoration from fans, who, you'll remember from episode one, turned up in the tens of thousands to see her character get married at Birmingham Cathedral in 1975. Gordon, or Nolly as she was called, was a talent on screen and an icon in the real world. After thousands of episodes of Crossroads, Nolly was a household name, an actor so beloved that she was dubbed Queen of the Midlands. What could possibly go wrong? But by 1981, she was out of a job, fired from the very show into which she poured so much time, effort, and love. Noel's infamous sacking came as a shock to just about everyone, including Noel herself. Shattered by this unfortunate and unexplainable event, Noel turned to her friend and collaborator, the popular entertainer Larry Grayson, who urged her back to her roots, back to where it all began, the stage. There now. This is where you started and this is where you belong. Larry, I am exhausted. Nonsense. I am 61 years old. Perfect age. Says the man who's retiring. I was born middle-aged. And you were born for this? While on a musical theater tour in Asia, Nolly finally learned the truth behind her traumatic sacking. Everyone keeps asking me why I was sacked, and I worked it out long ago. It was men, just men, being men. Well, yes, but that man in particular. What man? What did they tell you? Well, they didn't, but I want to know what man. What did he say? I'm sorry. It's none of my business, except I was there. I heard every word. I'm sorry, Miss Gordon, but I know exactly why you were sacked. Back in Birmingham, England, armed with the truth, Nolly confronted Crossroads producer Jack Barton. The two finally had the conversation that they should have had long ago, and it ended with a glimmer of hope. Come back, Nolly. Huh? No, I mean it. That's why I wanted to see you today. I miss you. I want you to come back. Gordon tragically died in 1985 at the age of 65, and until now, her legacy as a television pioneer and acting icon has been all but forgotten. In the hands of writer Russell T. Davis, however, Gordon's career and her legend has the opportunity to be rediscovered and reappraised by a new audience. While Gordon is no longer with us, Nolly is Davis's bittersweet love letter to the Queen of the Midlands and to television as a whole. And Nolly herself finds new life, embodied in the spellbinding performance of another legend. This week, we are joined by Nolly lead actor and newly minted BAFTA Television Award nominee, Helena Bonham Carter, who brought the dynamic and trailblazing Noel Gordon to our screens once again. And this week, we are joined by Nolly star Helena Bonham Carter. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So from Princess Margaret to the Queen of the Midlands, Noel Mm -hmm. Gordon, you have a penchant for playing, we'll say, complicated characters. Uh, What was it about Russell T. Davis's script for Nolly that initially attracted you to the role? The script was brilliant. It was just instantly brilliant. In fact, I couldn't believe it as I carried on reading it, it was getting better and better. Um, it was all character-led, really led by Nolly. Nolly was an incredibly dynamic character. I'll say this about Russell's script too, is it's, I think, the only script I've ever been involved with that the first, there was literally no difference between the first reading and what ends up on screen. He writes so tightly and so precisely, and there's nothing that's unnecessary. He's one of the greatest, you know, and most gifted storytellers. I felt so incredibly lucky that it landed in my lap. And I, you know, within the first page, I thought, I've got to do it. So you completed a 
ton of research prep for this project, including speaking to people who knew Noel Gordon, Crossroads stars, Tony Adams and Susan Hansen, and even stage manager Liz Stern, among many others. What sort of image did they paint of Noel Gordon? What sort of image did they evoke for you? I think I think initially when Russell approached it, he thought, oh, she's going to be somebody who's very complicated and not particularly um, appealing. But then as the investigation got to speak to people who knew her, he realized that she was, and through all these people that I spoke to, really loved and really respected. So quite a different picture, not without flaws, and which he, he definitely you know includes in the script, but somebody who was very incredibly professional, very opinionated, clever. Somebody had come from nothing. She was an East Ender. Uh, from East Ham, and then made good, been performing since she was a child, a real leader of the company, knew exactly, really, how the show should be done. I mean, she was in it day in, day out for so many years. She was formidable, but she was kind. She was a really good company leader, fun, funny. There was what I enjoyed sometimes, a confusion between her and the character. If you play a character day in, day out, the line between you and the character can get very, very blurred, as does it happen. It, that sort of is very much in the first scene that you see her when she's getting married as the character and the producer doesn't want to film because there's 10,000 people who are her fans who've turned up, you know, for Meg Mortimer, Meg Mortimer being her character, who is, just owns a motel. And so the producer is saying, well, you know what, we can't really film because... Meg doesn't know 10,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> Nolly, bit of a problem. Tell me. I'll fix it. What's wrong? It's the people outside. There are thousands of them. I mean, literally thousands. There's up to 10,000 people standing outside. And the problem is? They're in short. That's a problem because? They've come to see Nolly, but it's Meg who's getting married, not you. It's your character. I still can't see the problem. Meg owns a motel in Birmingham. It has 16 chalets. 16. I have to put this show on air and I can't, for the the love of God, work out why I would be showing 10,000 people at her wedding. Well, then the problem is you. And then Nolly was a real espouser of the people. You know, she was a working class person, but she also felt such loyalty to all these people who watched it, to her fans. And she turns it into a sort of Joan of Arc, Henry Dash, Henry V reason to, you know, speech about we have to do well by the fans. It doesn't matter if, you know, it makes zero sense. <laughs> if 10,000 people have turned up to show their love, then I think that's a wonderful thing. If they sit at home every day and have their tea and watch Crossroads and they see Meg, dealing with her family and her guests and the staff in all 16 chalets. And they think so much of her that they want to leave their homes in the cold and the wind and the rain to stand there, to give a little cheer. That's all. A faint little cheer on a miserable day. I mean, God knows they can barely afford the heating or the gas or the rent, and yet they still come to stand out there together. Then sort of person would cut them out of the picture. Tell me, what sort of person is that? (laughs) I mean, I was going to say, Helena, it is this blistering fire and ice speech about the 10,000 people, which it does become her version of a St. Crispin's Day speech. It's incredible. It was like she suddenly turns into this great leader of the people <laughs> it's, he's making such a reasonable point <laughs> and I loved it because there's part of her that is really quite insane I love play give me anybody with more than one color you know no definitely more than five colors anyone who's contradictions which we all are we all are, <laughs> are um, and she definitely was full of contradiction and very flawed but ultimately uh, amazing and extraordinary and she was a pioneer also for women in the sense that prior to Crossroads, she presented telly, she was a Women's Day presenter. She'd come and learnt in America, in New York, 
and studied and worked with American daytime TV shows and then led her own. There wasn't really anything that, that Noel Gordon couldn't do. I do want to drill down on that. I mean, she, as you say, she is a trailblazer. She is the first woman to appear on color television. Yeah. The first woman to interview a sitting prime minister. She's the first woman to do a lot of things, but she seems penalized for her womanhood, mm. for being particular or exacting. Was she ultimately punished for being just that, an, an outspoken woman? Yeah, I think it's that ultimate thing is being punished for being outspoken and right and clever. And men were terrified of her. Well, the men in suits, as she called them, the men who were nowhere near the set were making decisions. And she would confront. And she, that typical thing of, because she was a woman, she was seen to be seen difficult. But in a man's body, it would have been just seen the norm. She's definitely, a, you know, belongs to that forgotten history brushed under the carpet. I, I think they also, there's a really wonderful speech in episode three when she talks about the fact that she's a single older woman and that she doesn't feel really understood by society. This is in the 80s. And that there was a lot of rumours that she was gay. She wasn't gay. I mean, she didn't, nothing wrong with being gay, but she said, I'm not gay, but it's, there was, um, she said, she just felt there was an instinct by, definitely in the 80s, to sort of other her. They couldn't understand. How can you be single and not have, um, I think they were frightened. There's no relationship with a man. She didn't, wasn't married. She didn't have a child. Russell has this beautiful speech of, about the silent army of women with no name. And just because she wasn't with a man, she must therefore be a lesbian. And she felt that prejudice was horrendous. She was actually, she had an affair, a long, long term affair with a married man, uh, impresario. And that comes out in the story. We will, we will talk about Val Parnell and that scene in just a little bit. Nolly says at one point, I am making this show better if I have to haul it out of the grave oh. line by line. Uh, which she says about Crossroads. I mean, how do you then see Nolly's edicts? Are, are they done from what I hope is a place of love, a sense of duty, an almost selfless nobility? Or do you see that coming from a different place? No, I think it was utter devotion to the program. I don't think she had a naturally large ego. It wasn't ego and it wasn't a power thing. She was what she was. You know, there is that funny thing of no one sits in Noel Gordon's chair, but... She had a seniority because she earned it and she'd been in the show right from the start. In fact, it had been created around her and she knew what it was about. It wasn't because um, she needed to, you know, be more powerful. I think it was well-earned power. But I think the people who got rid of her did have a power thing and they felt uncomfortable deferring to a woman of that age. And someone who wasn't sexy, it's that thing. It's also when it's ageism too, I think. I mean, she was swiftly replaced by Gabriel Drake, who was about 30 years younger, again, red hair. And you go like, oh, my God, it's ridiculous. Why do they have to fancy everyone, you know, the employers? It's absurd. Anyway, we have come some way, I think. But we still have a ways to go. There is a, a beautiful ease to Noel's dynamic with her co-star, Tony Adams, who I believe cooked her dinner every night in addition oh, to driving her around. And their yeah. flats did look into one another from across the street. I love that relationship. Mm. What do you make of Nolly and Tony's rapport? And, and how did you and Augustus Prue work to achieve that dynamic? Well, Augustus is a one-off. You know, he really is an extraordinary person. He's got amazing energy and he's got amazing charisma and he's got that gift for intimacy. You know, people, some people, you just immediately feel comfortable. There wasn't any difficulty in, um, you know, having to create a history because they, they had, it was a long friendship. And I love the fact that you first see him as a chauffeur and they had these games, you know, he would dress with a chauffeur's hat, <laughs> drive her around <laughs> and uphold her as you know, her sense of she'd worked hard and got the got the Rolls Royce, you know, and he um, he really adored her. I spoke to Tony and he was such a nice man. He so loved her, um, so missed her. And um, he told one story, which was, so there's one point when she was really down. I think she might have been possibly ill or it might have been over the sacking. I can't remember. 
And so he cheered her up, saying, come on, let's go and drink some champagne and drive around. So he drove around and then she said, let's switch the radio on. And in the pouring rain, I can't remember which song, because they love songs, musicals. They danced in the rain. Oh. To, I wish I remembered the song. I just said, oh, I wish we could put that in. It was just a sense of fun. And also, I love musicals. And she was such a great, she loves singing. There's one episode in Crossroads, which is hilarious, where she just unashamedly starts singing as if it's the Noel Gordon show. And she was of that era, which is a proper musical, uh, Palladia, you know, variety singer, musical actress. And she sings this song and then she starts and turns to the camera and sings directly to the camera. So she breaks the fourth wall and which I think is referenced in the, in a way in the, in the piece. And, you know, the rest of the cast, I spoke to the, the Susan Hansen was brilliant. And she said, we didn't really know what to do. We just thought, Oh my God, let's just, but she was just had so much joy and felt like she's going to entertain the troop. She's going to entertain those people at home and they've had an awful day and we're just going to have fun. And um, anyway, it's fun. It's very funny. What she had with Tony was a sort of mirroring of the platonic relationship that Gordon had with Larry Grayson, this, the diva and her, her gay best friend. But there's a different sort of intimacy of tenderness between Noel and Larry, one that I think is really just beautifully depicted by you and Mark Gatiss here. How pivotal is the Larry Grayson sequence to the narrative? Do you see it as the emotional heart of the drama? Well, it's the, she's on her upper. She knows she's sad. She doesn't know what she's going to do. And she goes and visits her friend who's of a similar age. And they feel like, well, they're going to be, they're going to be dinosaurs soon. You know, they're obsolete because of age. And it's such a cruel business that you get to an age and then suddenly people don't really want you. But he's the one who suggests that she has another act. And um, it's such a touching scene. Mark is such a great actor. I love it. It's, it is this opportunity to sort of strip everything down, just as Larry sort of removes his girdle. The Nolly that we see here, so sure of everything previously, is so vulnerable in this scene. She can take off her emotional girdle here. Yeah. And what was filming this scene like with Mark, and what sort of direction did Peter Hoare give you? Well, Peter was brilliant right from the start. A brilliant, also, Peter's brilliant at uh, working with Russell and interpreting his um, his script. He'd worked with him on It's a Sin. Nicholas Schindler, who'd produced it, had also worked with him. The team were immaculate. I will say it was one of the happiest and the most efficient filming experiences I've ever had. And, uh, you know, when you're on most of the time, it's how something is run is so integral to your ability to pull it off. Uh, so I was so grateful. I mean, Mark's just brilliant. So, and he was such a fan of Larry. So he was really funny between the takes because he was always doing more Larry Grayson. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and Larry really was exceptional too. Very loved again. And they had this sort of, everyone thought they got engaged. It's a story. They always thought, the public thought that Larry and Noel were engaged. I mean, it could not have been more obvious that Larry was gay, but it was um, <laughs> in a time you weren't allowed to be. So they just pretend that they were each other's beards, you know, and uh, they understood each other and they were allowed to be vulnerable, but they were two old pros, you know, they've been performing since for years and realizing, oh, we're on our way out. What do we do next? Um, mm. Whereas, you know, Tony is a wonderful friend, but he's that much younger. He was, so he couldn't quite be in sync with her when it came to the age thing. Whereas Larry was her contemporary. Nolly becomes a piece of two halves, the, the public and the private. And throughout Nolly, those two spheres are at odds. We see Nolly, the grand dame of the set and the stage, and we see Nolly at home making a ham sandwich and turning on every <laughs> single light in her flat. Uh, which of these two aspects do you feel is the real Gordon? Is it the one secretly reading scripts in her kitchen or lying about taping episodes of Crossroads on her VCR? Well, she had a huge front and she was, um, the sad thing about, I mean, the amazing thing about Nolly was that she was completely professional and she was devoted to her work which was grueling in day in, day out. I mean, they had ridiculous schedules. 
but she had nothing else. There was nothing else apart from her relationship, which is revealed in the episode three. But that was it. So the loneliness, I love those lights turning on. It, it feels like she returns home to an empty flat and um, has to cook for her one. And so there's a real schism between being adored by all the fans and actually coming home to nobody. Didn't even have a pet. But luckily she had Tony across the way. But that was it. She had her mum. And her mum was crucial. And I think that's where Russell also feels that the producers were even more unconscionably cruel to her. Because she, her mum lived above her. And had been a constant companion, and in fact, basically put on the stage age two. And she only died probably about a year before our drama starts. So she's still in mourning, or two years maybe. But I think that it was very, very recent. So with that knowledge, they still deliver the body blow of, of the sacking. And on top of it, don't even tell her why. Which is the cruelest part, I think. I mean, the sacking has dented her confidence, we'll say, uh, to put it mildly. I mean, she she struggles with her Sing Out Louise entrance. Uh, she says, this part is a monster. She's a legend. She's a major piece of work, and I'm not good enough. Mm. And she compares herself unfavorably to Ethel Merman, Angela Lansbury. Does the loss of Crossroads for Nolly, her life's purpose, her ambitions undone by betrayal, does it echo Rose's own loss here? Yeah. I think she did. I mean, in a way, I loved the choice of Gypsy. I mean, it was in real, for real, because in some ways, I didn't think she'd ever looked quite at her own mother. Her mother was really Gypsy Rosalie. Her mother did put her on the stage and put all this pressure on. And she was like, she was put in, you know, and put to work as a very young child. So um, however much she loved her mum, uh, I did think, oh, there's an interesting mirroring. The other thing is, you know, if you do the same job year in, year out, you get pretty lazy or just the same muscles get exerted. So to do, do that and then gypsy, which is on stage, is a huge leap. It would terrify anyone, frankly, whether you've just been sacked or not. She was having an identity crisis. I'm sure the end is, was totally because she didn't recover from that loss. Before this next question, a brief word from our sponsors. Ocean Voyages, Expeditions, River Journeys, Viking is dedicated to bringing travelers closer to the destination, offering a small ship experience and a shore excursion in every port. Learn more at viking.com. She takes the spotlight backstage and she speaks her truth and recounts her romance with Val Parnell. But the point still stands when you are a woman with no husband, no partner, no children. Society doesn't know who you are. There's no place for us, this silent army of women with no name. Actually, that is offensive. Thank you. You're right. Thank you. Bastards. Exactly. But I did have someone. I gave him 20 years of my life. Val Parnell. And she delivers this breathtakingly fierce speech about her sacking. I was sacked because... I was sackable. Those men just did what they always do. They singled me out, they bared their teeth, and they brought me down. And then they raised a glass of champagne and moved on to the next. And yes, I will sing your song downstage, if that is going to get us to the West End. I will sing your bloody song downstage right here in front of 1,000 people. That moment, it, it's such a moment of catharsis, of beautiful catharsis. And it's a, a bravura moment for Nolly, but also for, for you, Helena. And it's 
impossible not to sit enraptured as the actors in Gypsy do, eating up this this moment in every word. I mean, what did you make of the monologue when you first oh. read it in the script? I was, I thought this is so beautiful. And then I also thought, oh, fuck, you know, I'm terrified because I'm going to have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. But again, Peter was brilliant at helping me and breaking it down into bits. Um, I learn lines months ahead, mostly due to, well, partly due, due, due to terror, but also I really want to make it my own. And I feel like the longer it's in my unconscious and the many more nights that I've slept with lines and and the material, and worked out the thought process, all the things that have added up. You're always wanting to try and make those words inevitable, whatever the word is. So, but then there was the thing of, okay, now we've got to, you see, in film, it's so irritating that you, or television, you never get to rehearse in a physical space. So then it's marrying that. So I I definitely, I think, me and Peter visited the theatre way before we went to shoot it. And then I'm very particular about the chair, all sorts of things, things that you don't want to be thrown, the clothes again. And what was really helpful was Russell. So, I mean, I love Russell and it meant that I could, he loves actors, not a given actually. Some writers and indeed directors don't love necessarily actors <laughs> or want to discuss the process. But he said in that last speech, the music, the da 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 should be, it's in the rhythm of that speech. And I thought, oh, my God, that's great to know. And it's so sometime um, to have the music. And, in fact, he he began, he began the composer, they, it begins before, as she's building up. And I said, okay, great. So the inevitable bit of breaking out into the song, it begins at the beginning of that speech, even though there's a jump cut in in film so that sort of thing was like invaluable I said oh thank you Russell I was always phoning him for tips and texting him mm-hmm. and he was brilliant at reassuring me frankly giving me compliments to just again to <laughs> every act <laughs> everybody's you know confidence is on the floor most of the time and no matter what and it was a big it was a massive part and I was pretty it was very demanding and also I was on all the time so look when you're tired a lot of the time I can get really, really self-critical. So he was brilliant at just um, keeping the inner critic and not being too vociferous. Nolly discovers why she was sacked in Bangkok, but she finally gets her confrontation with Jack Barton in a hotel in Birmingham. I was given this piece of paper by a policeman in Bangkok. It's far too long a story. I was sacked because I'm a bully because I'm a prima donna because I'm delusional I make people go through hell I'm a fly in the ointment it appears I was sacked because I'm a difficult asset but there's the question would you have done that to a man is that ultimately the crux of Nolly I think it is the crux of what Russell is talking about and of this time, and possibly now. I hate the word difficult. It's often like, oh, she's being difficult. And you're like, no, she isn't. You wouldn't say that of him. Oh, he's being difficult. It's such a it's such a word that you tend to just put with a woman, don't you? I never really heard a man being difficult. They like a man. I've been called difficult. Have you been, been difficult? Have you been difficult? <laughs> 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 but um. No, I think definitely, uh, certainly, even if they'd sacked the man, they would have had to tell him. Um, it would have been an old boys' network chat, probably. They were all terrified of her. It's a very good scene. She never had that scene in real life. She never got to know, actually. And she never got to confront Jack Barton. You know, Russell really um, loves championing the underdog. And he did that with It's a Sin, that whole generation that died of AIDS. And he does it for Nolly. She, she feels he gives her that scene. She never did get that scene in real life. And the whole thing is a send off. When I got it, the script, I said, Why are you doing this? She said, Because this woman was amazing. 
And yeah, he was a big Crossroads fan and he loves uh, soap opera. But he also felt she was really hard done by and treated badly and deserved a proper send off. And the most touching thing was shooting the end scene in Venice. Well, it wasn't actually in Venice. We were in Liverpool, but pretending to be in Venice. There was a lot of very resourceful filmmaking in this. <laughs> and they got the real Tony Adams and the real Susan Hansen to come. And they were clapping. You you wouldn't probably recognise them because you probably wouldn't recognise what they looked like. But it was so touching that in the big clap off when Jack Barton finally, you know, she goes back to the show and he gives her the final applause that she deserved right from the start. Then there's a cut away of the real actors who were in the original and there was so and they're sitting at that table. They're sitting, sitting at that, at that little table, table exactly. on the side. Yeah. And so they were so chuffed to be there and give her the applause. And also luckily they approved of what I was doing. And they felt, oh yeah, no, she's coming in loud and clear. And I was I found it so moving. And did you feel a bigger sense of responsibility to Gordon filming that scene, knowing that that Tony and Susan were sitting feet from you yeah watching you as their their late friend i had phoned them many times they gave me so much and i think by then they'd seen enough to know that i was okay and they were so supportive which was so nice what was so nice was they were so pleased to talk about her again it was like having their friend back in the room i i had the similar thing with princess margaret who had a complicated reputation but when I spoke to the people who were close to her her royal friends they again were so pleased to talk about their old friend and they really loved and admired her and she was so funny and it was a similar thing with Noel a really strong woman both of them were very strong women who did not bite did not eat their words and they were unapologetically themselves and um didn't demur didn't play low status women, but utterly themselves. And uh, I loved that. I felt so privileged that I got to speak to people who were close to them and that they felt safe enough with me to talk about them. I think it was quite therapeutic in a way. They must be. Yeah, and they both died too young. Far too young. Particularly uh, Noel. 65 for Noel. Yeah, yeah, way too young. Yeah, unfair. I love the scene that you and Augustus have uh, this incredible beautiful moment together where Noel says of all the men in her life it's it's Tony mm-hmm. that she loves and you kiss Augustus's hand so tenderly so sweetly how did you read that moment between them and what Noel Gordon acknowledges here I think she just means it I think often we think that our romantic relationships have to be the ones that are most important. And often it's the friendship. And uh, often they're not sung, you know, they're not given the same, the right um, attention or the right recognition. And for her, Tony was absolutely paramount. Um, and she really loved him and she, and he loved her. And knew each other, you know, they really witnessed each other um, and loved all, you know, every witness and knew every, you know, every flaw, every crook and cranny, but with that, they were there for each other. And what she does, and I thought this must be invented, you know, when she goes off on the QE2, which is completely absurd, um, <laughs> he did hire a boat to try and cheer her up. I love that imagination that he had for his friend. What is funny, and it is a really funny piece, is the farcical element of how these men in suits really take their revenge and put the boot in. They really didn't like Noel, for whatever reasons, I think, feeling threatened. And so they invent, they keep on working out how how they're going to get rid of her as a character. And it's just, and she can't but take it personally. And that's part of the humor and it's completely absurd and being you know they actually put her on the QE2 which is a ship and she had to go all the way to France and back um <laughs> by herself by herself yeah, by herself I mean talk about getting rid of somebody oh my god the final montage we get is a 
a devastating sequence to watch. We see the the highs and lows of a life lived. But it ends with a beatific Gordon at her most magnificent, the return of the queen, haloed. What did you make of this this juxtaposition here? And, And what is captured in her gaze? Does she finally feel at peace in this moment? Yes, I think she feels she was apologized to, possibly. And she feels she's had a great life. And she did have a great life. And she's doing her, I think she feels it's okay. I don't. I think she's without bitterness at the end, and that applause, that recognition, although a bit late in the day, (laughs) came. So you have somebody who's reflecting back and going, "It wasn't half bad." Um, Yeah, that's what I think. What do you think? I mean, I think it's all of that. I think it's the sum experience of her entire life captured in one look. And I think it bookends our beginning with her looking into the camera uh, as the first woman on color TV. On color television. And I think she looks at us and uh, we see her and she's seen. Yeah, she's seen. I think that's absolutely key that, that, thank you for that. She is seen and that's what Russell wanted. Felt like she was just brushed under the carpet. She was the queen of the Midlands. She was like some soap opera you know, person who was probably rather difficult. And now he tells her story and gives her the send off that she deserved. And she, I think that's exactly it. She's seen. You didn't attend drama school. Your acting career began because you won a poetry writing contest and parlayed the winnings from that into allegedly a listing in Spotlight, I hear. Mm -hmm. What was the impetus behind your desire to become a professional actor? I think I just wanted to be somebody else, to be honest. I sort of wanted to escape reality and be um, put on costume and be something that was more dramatic and more fun and escape me, I think. It did coincide. I mean, I I, I did find an agent when I was very young. I was only 13. And it coincided with my dad falling really ill. Um, He was in intensive care, in fact, when I got an agent. So there was a feeling that, I think, not necessarily conscious, well, no, sort of conscious that I had to be self-sufficient and also a feeling of that I couldn't control reality, but then I could just escape it by creating my own. So I think that was it. You were thrust into the public eye with your breakout role as Lucy Honeychurch in one of my favorite films of all time, A Room With A View. Uh, opposite Daniel Day-Lewis, Judy Dench, Maggie Smith, and Julian Sands, to name but a few of the film's many luminaries. You watched, I believe, the silent rushes uh, of that film, sat mm. between your mother and grandmother, uh, watching yourself on screen. Do you still feel that same sense of... Depression. <laughs> uh, do you still feel that? I mean, watching yourself. I watched Nolly. And I thought it was unbearable the first time I watched it. And um, really, I just vortex. You know, I just go down an absolute black hole. At least now I've got an awareness that this is what happens. And it might not be directly related to the truth or an objective. There's something pathological, which is probably why I went into acting in the first place, to get away from me. And then I watch something and I go, oh, my God, I'm still stuck with me. Hmm. And also when you're watching something, it's such an odd business because we're not in con- we're in in control in some ways because we and then we're so not in control because no one really asks you to edit and so there's so many different choices that you could have made or didn't make um there's a myriad of things as you watch something that you're in that you go oh no I would have done that 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 and so very quickly uh there stacks up a net you know a list of negatives and then you get drowned and then you go like oh forget it I'm just gonna switch off. Then you watch it again, maybe a week later, once you've gone through the depression and reassurance by other people who are not involved, that maybe it's worth um, revisiting. I always have to watch something before I do ADR and because then I feel like I've got some control and I can change a choice now that I see the sweep of the story context again. Then you emerge from the depression and then you go, okay, this is what I've got. Work with what you have. And you begin to see the story 
because it's in, in a way it's sort of an inverted narcissism because you're so critical, but you, you fail to see everybody else's work and you fail to see the story. And it's very difficult to watch a story innocently when you have been so closely involved. And my instinct always, whenever I watch anything that I'm involved with, is get a move on, come on, get a move on, get a move on. And that's just because you know unconsciously what's going to happen. And I just feel so acutely embarrassed. I feel like, oh, come on, come on, come on. This is boring. So um, I comfort myself going, you can never actually judge. But at least now I work with myself. Whereas on Room the View, I remember that after the first, I mean, that was just terrible. It was deep gloom that Sunday. And it was impossible. And my mother and my grandmother also were chatting it was mute. They didn't have sound then with rushes, and I just found them it's so embarrassing. And they were they were French, and they were going, "Ah, mais comme elle est jolie." I was going, "Shut up! It doesn't matter what I look like." <laughs> I, and it was like, "Oh, it was awful." You were recently named the president of the London Library, a position previously held by Tennyson, Eliot, and Stoppard, to to name a few. What does the role mean to you? I was so amazed to be asked. My father made me a member when I was 21. It was my 21st birthday. It's um, it's such an amazing institution, the London Library. It's this old Georgian building on St. James's Square. And it's like this sort of living museum. You're allowed to go in, obviously, and touch all these books and take these books out. And you can feel the ghosts. And you can feel the energy and you can't but be inspired. I love, and I've been lucky given my profession to visit all places, you know, and I, I love the effect of a location or a place on one's inside, on one's imagination, on how you feel. And it's, it's, it's an amazing place. Also, the other thing is no one talks. So you've got this sacredness of silence and you can go up and down these stacks, they call the stacks, which are these um, these corridors of books that all these great writers, George Eliot, it's just living history. And I felt so honoured to be asked as the, to be the first woman. Uh, I said, I'm not a writer. They're all writers, the previous. They didn't seem to mind. They said, you're to, to do with story. And... Um, I had a friend of mine was an amazing woman who ran a circus. She was called Nell Gifford, and she died way too prematurely. But um, it's now three years, I guess. It was her father who said, who was on the board, a trustee, and said, would you consider it? And I thought, oh, Nell would love it. So it was in the name of Nell and in the name Mm. of my father. And I love being called president. I mean, for that alone, president. (laughs) Bonham <laughs> Amazing. Helena Bonham Carter, thank you so very much. Oh, my pleasure. Next time, as we prepare for our new spring title, Mr. Bates versus the Post Office, we bring you up to speed on the ins and outs of the British postal system. I've never been able to get to grips with the system. And when I try to get help... As you must know, your contract with us makes clear losses are your responsibility. Like once, I was on the phone to the helpline and it doubled. It just doubled the shortfall before my very eyes. Mrs Hamilton, this is public money. We need to talk about how you're going to pay it back. Mr Bates versus the post office writer Gwyneth Hughes joins us next week to discuss the remarkable real-life story of one of the most significant miscarriages of justice in British history. Masterpiece Studio is hosted by me, Jay Slaycob, produced by Jack Pombriant, and edited by Robin Bissett. Alicia Ba Etup is our sound designer. The executive producer for Masterpiece is Suzanne Simpson. Hold up. 